All right, let's jump into today's message. It's entitled, um, A Prosperous Identity. Do you have a prosperous identity? And um, as we look at this, I want to just share that today is kind of the concluding message of, of this series on developing a generous heart. And as we look at developing a generous heart, I want to go back to the original message that was really, is God really that generous? Is God really that generous? And if you missed that message, it'd be important for you to, to go back and review that because it's so foundational. Uh, the other three have built upon it. And then the second message is a heart transplant of the realization that uh, we need a heart transplant in order to receive the generosity of God and begin to convey that to others. Last week we talked about is generosity, is it attracted or pursued? And it's totally different from how we think in life. We think that we have to pursue things. We're taught that. I read from the Constitution, I mean, not from the Declaration of Independence. It said that we are to pursue happiness. But yet in the kingdom of God, it's attracted to us. Because God is a generous God. He lives inside of us. It's just a whole different way of thinking. And so today is going to be one of those that I'm sure I'm going to mess with your mind about how you have uh, grown up. And uh, we're going to, to look at what it means to have and to carry a prosperous identity. Uh, you know, you get in trouble when you mention the word prosperous in church. <laughs> Lots of people kind of react to it because it hasn't been handled with that well. And uh, yet, I'm not afraid of that term because I understand it biblically. I understand what it means biblically. But oftentimes, what it's associated with is that it's only associated with riches. And I heard said recently that wealth is who you have. Riches is what you have. Wealth is who you have. Riches is what you have. And if you chase riches you will actually end up in a poverty mindset because you're chasing the rewards and not the rewarder. And what happens is that you actually, you're focused upon what you don't have and what you lost and what you might lose and what your fear of what you could gain and how you steward. But you actually end up in a poverty mindset if you chase riches. But when you understand that when you have God, you have the wealth of God, then the riches just come and hang around you without stress and without ulcers and without anxiety. They just come hang around you and then you manage them. It's a beautiful way to live. It's different oftentimes from how we live or, or how we taught. You see, once your internal reality lines up with God's invisible reality, your external reality will become prosperous from your internal identity. Uh, we just jumped in the deep one, you guys. <laughs> right? Let me say that again. Once your internal identity lines up with God's invisible reality, your external reality will become prosperous through your internal identity. How are we doing? Are we swimming yet? That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Amazing. So let's jump in and find out how it works. What does the prosperous identity look like? We're going to go to 3 John, 3 John chapter, well, there's only one chapter in John. So, you know, I forget whether you say 1 John 1 and 2 and 3 or just go right to the verses. So I guess you just go to the verses because there's only one chapter. But I want to give you context about 3 John before I state the verses. It's pretty much um, agreed that 3 John was written in the year 90 A.D., now, if you know anything about church history, you know that Jesus lived the first 30 years, 33 somewhere he died, and then the early church started, and it prospered and grew, and there was persecution and expanded. And then uh, 70 AD, the Romans came down, and they conquered Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple and the city, and, and, and uh, Christianity was dispersed into other nations. People ran for caves. They ran for the hills. And then we get to 90 AD, when in probably this letter, these verses were written when John was on the Isle of Patmos. So he was exiled. He was alone. People didn't want to be around him. The glory of God was all over him. Whether, the, whether it was the government or whoever it was, was, was getting rid of John and, and trying to, you know, send him to a, a, an island to die. And so John's out there and he writes these words. I want you to hear the context because it wasn't the circumstances that were all wonderful and, and in line and that uh, religious persecution didn't exist and, and everybody had their freedoms. That's not the environment he was in. He was in the environment of being rejected. 
He was in the environment of, he didn't know who his friends were. He was in the environment of being all alone. And yet he writes these words. Here's what he says. I'm using the Passion Translation just because it, uh, it really conveys what I feel like the heart of God here in John, 3 John 2-4. through 4. Beloved friends, I pray that you are prospering in every way. That you continually enjoy good health just as your soul is prospering. I was filled with joy and delight when the brothers arrived and informed me of your faithfulness to the truth. They told me how you lived continually in the truth of Christ. It is the greatest joy of my life to hear that my children are consistently living their lives in the ways of truth. Sounds like the heart of a parent, doesn't it? Towards their children. Any parent would wish that their child would live continually in the ways of truth. And John is conveying that to his friend Gaius as he's writing here these words. But he states two things starting out. He says, I wish that you would prosper in every way. And he includes two things, good health, that would be the external. And then he says, just as your soul is prospering, that's the internal. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. More the internal than the external. John is saying that when our soul is prospering, then things around us begin to prosper. But it first starts inside of us. I was in a situation that uh, happened. It was two people that were not getting along. And, and so I was listening to them trying to work it out. And as they were working it out, uh, one person just got finished. And they're like, I'm done. I'm, I'm not going to keep in on this conversation. And they got up and dismissed themselves. They tooted both their horns and left. And, and so we're like, wow, we didn't expect that. And the other person was re remaining. I had some thoughts and I got fairly pointed about uh, something that needed to be let go and other things the person was right on. And, and they like, wow, I didn't see that coming. Can we pray? I said, absolutely. So we prayed and the person left. They called me the next day and said, I sat alone with God and God showed me what was happening in my life. What it ended up being was just lack of information. The one party had taken an offense over a lack of information. And God was the one that showed it to them. And they said, I just repented before God. I just did not have the right information. And now that I have the right information, I'm free. I want to reconcile. I want to get together and talk this out. I said, go to it. You don't need me. If God's spoken to you, let it happen. And I understand it got worked out. You see, that person was operating from a prosperous soul. Not that they didn't have a conflict. But they sat and they heard God and God was clear and they acted upon it. And as a result, relationships got worked out and unity came into being. Amazing. See, it's not the absence of problems or challenges or whatever. But it's the hope that we live within us. That God can work things out. That's living for my prosperous identity or prosperous soul. Let's dive in here. Number one, a prosperous identity is secure regardless of circumstances. A prosperous identity is secure regardless of circumstances. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he closes out Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul had a prosperous soul. He had a prosperous identity. He came to the conclusion every one of those situations that are mentioned there have a challenge to them. He said in death, that's a challenge. In life, life has its challenges. In angels or demons, the spiritual that sometimes we don't see that we get attacked from. Even in the present or the future, any powers, neither if you're on the mountaintop or you're in the valley, height nor depth. He said that in all creation, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. Wow, he settled it. Have you settled it? 
But sometimes what happens in our day and time is we let circumstances separate us from the love of God or the hope that God can work things out or even the faith that he will. We allow them to illumine so big and affect us so strong that we can't have the faith that God wants to bring because we're not living from a prosperous soul. We're letting the circumstances dictate how we are living rather than God. Paul settled it. Nothing can separate. And he lived that way and spoke that way. A couple of bullet points I have, therefore I just bought a gun this weekend, so I'm operating out of bullet points here. Um, <clears throat> when circumstances decide our reaction, there's a lack of prosperous identity. When circumstances decide our reaction, there's a lack of prosperous identity. Let's hear what James has to say in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. My dear friends, you should be quick to listen and slow to speak or to get angry. If you are angry, you cannot do any of the good things God wants done. That's what James says. He's very clear that he wants us to live from a prosperous soul. And a prosperous soul is one that is slow to speak and quick to listen and not get angry. You know, you can express your anger without being angry. I've done that before. I, that makes me angry. But I'm not throwing things or raising my voice or walking out. But I'm letting people know that makes me angry. See, there's ways to let people know that we're upset and that's challenging for us. But yet that's operating from a self-controlled, prosperous soul, not acting out upon that. That's how we're supposed to live. God's purpose is are not accomplished when you're angry. That's what James tells us through the Holy Spirit. So where does this prosperous soul come from? Our identity comes into us, not something that starts from within. Our identity comes into us, not something that starts from within. We have to recognize the difference between the world's view and Christianity. Is the world's view says that if you take somebody that is out of control and needs to be brought in control, you start a program or you pass some laws, and as a result of starting that program and putting them into it and passing some laws that said you shouldn't do it, you will actually curb people's behavior. Does that work? No, it doesn't work. Look around, watch the news. So what is Christianity? Christianity says there is something that comes into you from somewhere else. It is God from above. You, when you say born again, it actually means born from above. There's something of God that comes into you and changes your heart on the inside so that you don't respond in a negative way but in a positive way on the outside. So it has to come from the outside first, and then it comes into us, and then it begins to grow inside. God living inside of us, developing that prosperous identity inside. Let me read from the Living Bible how James says it in 17 and 18. But whatever is good and perfect comes to us from God, the creator of light. He shines forever without change or shadow. And it was a happy day for him when he gave us our new lives through the truth of his word. And we become, as it were, the first children in his new family. What a couple of verses. James is telling us that God doesn't change. And we're the ones that receive him through the word of truth. That he comes in and lives inside of us. It's not based on our circumstances. It's based on the wealth of who is living inside of us. Anybody at any time, in any place, in any condition, we would agree they can be born again. Do you believe that? I believe that. I don't care if you're happy, you're sad, you're trapped, you're, you're abused, whatever. Anybody at any time, in any place can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Right? Yet how many of us have chosen to believe that because of our circumstances we can't do what God is calling us to do because our circumstances have trapped us? And we fall into that trap of saying circumstances are so clouded, so unclear, so destructive, I can't do what God's called me to do. And we fall into that trap, yet we would believe that somebody in any condition in life can call upon the Lord and be saved. 
but we can't believe that God could actually move us out or that we could be prosperous in the condition that we're in and still be happy even though the, the situation hasn't changed. Am I talking to the right crowd? Yeah. All right. I've been there before and I still get there at times. So I'm not just, you know, preaching at you. I'm looking in the mirror. We'll get there here in a few moments. Number two, a prosperous identity stays planted in truth. A prosperous identity stays planted in truth. Psalm 1, 1 through 3, describes a prosperous identity. And uh, I'm going to just read verse 3, and then, and then I'm going to read uh, the, the first three verses here in a few moments. But verse 3 says this, That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prospers. That's what it says in Psalms. starts out there. So there is a, a, a prosperous soul then lives out of truth. If you want to be a victim, live out of circumstances. If you want to be prosperous, live out of truth. That's the difference. The Living Bible says it this way. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow evil men's advice. Who do not hang around with sinners scoffing at the things of God. But they delight in doing everything God wants them to. And day and night are always meditating on his laws, thinking about ways to follow him more closely. They are like trees along a riverbank bearing luscious fruit each season without fail. Their leaves will never wither, and all they do shall prosper. That's an amazing set of verses, isn't it? It says here, first of all, that we should not get the advice of evil people, meaning people who don't fear the Lord, people that don't care about God. We shouldn't necessarily take their advice. Now, I understand uh, they're, they're, you, know, you have to wade into each situation, but generally that's the case. Depends on what it is. The second thing is that the person that operates out of a prosperous soul or identity, they meditate on the word of the Lord. Because that's where they know their wealth is coming from. It's coming from God who lives within and they meditate on him. And then third is wherever they are planted, they prosper. What family they're in, what community they live in, what job they have, what neighbors are next to them. That everything that they do prospers because they are not hanging around evil people that are scoffing at the Lord. They are meditating on the word of the Lord that's filling them up. And as a result of that, again... Prosperity is attracted to them and other people see it around them. That was last message coming into today, last week's. So whatever it is, it says you bear fruit in season. Now here's the mistake that we make. Externally, we understand there is a season for fruit and there's a season not for fruit. And what's happened is that we have superimposed just because visibly there is a time that we see fruit and times that we don't, we then superimpose that because it's not the season of external fruit, meaning that it's, that circumstance hasn't changed, that because the circumstance hasn't changed visibly, the fruit isn't seen visibly, that we can't be prosperous in the middle of that before it changes. That's what it means to live by faith. Your external hasn't changed yet. Abraham lived by faith. He didn't have a son. He had a promise. God even made an oath that said, you're going to have a son between you and Sarah out of your loins. He didn't see it yet. He was living in faith, but he carried this prosperous internal identity, believing that God would bring it about, even though it hadn't happened yet. He didn't see it, and yet he lived prosperous, believing that promise would come. Yet so many of us get crushed by our circumstances rather than believing that we can live in the midst of those circumstances that aren't in line with God yet. They have to get in line within us first before they will then come in alignment with God visibly. It has to start with us first. That's what it's called living by faith. Here's a thought. The visible has seasons. The invisible has continuous fruit. 
I, uh, I uh, submit my sermons to, to the outline at least, you know, to look and make sure it's, it's uh, words are spelt right and things make sense. And Billy's the one that uh, kind of does that for me now. And he came back and said, man, this, just, this verse just doesn't make sense. And I'm like, okay, I need to revisit it. And I did revisit it. I came back with a better verse. Hallelujah. I mean, this is amazing. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. I think God did that because he wanted me to find this verse. Here it is. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. You like that? Huh. Blessed is the person who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. That's good. It gets better. He is like a tree planted by water and sends out its roots into the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, the external circumstances, for its leaves remain green and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Wow. Wow. So even when you're living in a drought, Abraham moved to a desert and lived and God pr prospered him in the desert. Those conditions weren't right in the visible, the normal, to be prospered by. And yet Abraham prospered. So inside we can continue to bear fruit even though the external is not bearing fruit yet. The external might have its seasons, but internally we can continuously be prosperous in our soul. It's oftentimes different from how we think. I believe that at Crossroads we prospered through COVID. We could have easily said, oh man, I guess we just have to close the doors and go online and give up. But we didn't choose to do that. We chose to cooperate at the level that our conscience would let us. And then we said, okay, we're going to trust God. And it wasn't just me. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm also being blessed by your faith as well. We decided to trust God at a level that we never trusted him before for his protection and his healing and his wisdom and his grace. And we prospered the last two years when everybody else was struggling. Not everybody else, but we chose to prosper because we were living out of a prosperous soul we raised a half a million dollars to the next place God's going to take us and everybody would go no the circumstances the conditions are not right to start a funding campaign but that's not what God said God said no now's the time and we saw the fruit of that you see it's what's going on in the inside that tells the outside what to do. Not the outside dictating how the inside should believe. It's amazing stuff. But it's oftentimes not how we think. Our identity in Christ is the greatest wealth deposit that we have. Our identity in Christ is the greatest wealth deposit that we have. I uh, remember a testimony of a Christian counselor that was called on the stand to testify for a client. And as he was standing on the stand, the prosecutor started coming at him and says, Oh, you say you're a Christian, are you? Where'd you go to school? What kind of a school is that? That's a second-rate school. And these, these things that you're recommended to your client, I mean, what are they? That's ridiculous. And all of a sudden, he began to boil up and boil over at these accusations that were coming from the prosecutor. And then the Holy Spirit inside started to speak. And said, that's not who you are. You're my child. You are speaking my truth. You have wisdom from me. And he started listening to the inside of him. Rather than the prosecutor coming from the outside. And he settled down in peace. And finished what he had to say. See, that's how we need to live. Because the prosecutor will come at us at different times. But the question is, who's living inside? Are we pulling from a prosperous soul? Or are we letting the circumstances determine that? Our greatest wealth is who is living on the inside, not what surrounds us on the outside. John 4.14, Jesus is speaking to the woman of the well, and he says this, 
But whoever drinks the water that I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Do you hear what's happening? It gets better. John 7, 38. Whoever believes in me, Jesus is talking again. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has says, rivers of living water will flow out from within them. So it starts in a spring and then goes into a river. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Now how does that apply? I want to take you to Daniel chapter 3, 28 through 30. Nebuchadnezzar. He is a pagan king. He could care less about God. And yet something happened because three men stood up and they decided that they were going to live from who was inside of them rather than the circumstances that were causing them, that were asking them to bow around them. Let me read it to you. Nebuchadnezzar says, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted him and defied the king's commands and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any other god except their own. Therefore, pagan king, I decree that the people of any nation or language who sow anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. Wow. Make your house into a parking lot. For no other God can save this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He promoted them in the midst of probably one of the more demonic, evil empires that ever ruled on the face of the earth. Because they stood, they knew who was living on the inside. And they stood in the face of whatever circumstances were surrounding them and trying to press on them. They stood in the face of that and they said, we will not bow. And as a result of that, the king recognized that and he promoted them. In the midst of ungodly circumstances. Rather than demoted them. That's amazing isn't it? They drew from the deposit within them. Not the deposit around them. Number three. Operating from a prosperous soul. How do we get there? Proverbs 10.22. The blessings of the Lord establishes wealth. And difficulty does not accompany it. You can become prosperous without God. Okay. But what's going to happen if you do, it's going to include stress and anxiety and worry and ulcers and do I continue? You can get rich without God. It's possible. But what accompanies someone that does so without the Lord being central in what's happening is they attract all the anxiety and worry and stress and challenge but when you attract riches from a prosperous soul, there's no stress. There's no worry. There's no anxiety because you know that it's all God's and he's brought it to you. And he's given you wisdom to know how to manage it. And it's a beautiful thing. As my friend Isaac would say, I'm too blessed to be stressed, right? I didn't understand that. For I thought it was weird. Now I'm getting it. I thought, I thought he was strange. But now I'm understanding. Too blessed to be stressed. That's cute and funny, but there's a lot of reality to that when you understand a prosperous soul. Here we go. Three things. It requires a constant gaze into the mirror of Jesus. Let me give you some late-breaking news. You have never seen your face with your eyes. I mean... I, I, see, I see my lips a little bit. I can push them out and see those. And my nose is fairly big, so I can see the corner of that. But you have never seen your face with your natural eyes. You see other people's faces, but not yours. But we have this thing called a mirror. It's above our vanity, and we walk in half blurry-eyed and hair all out of place. And, and we trust that mirror to reflect an image that puts us in place. We trust that, don't we? We think that that's an exact representation <laughs> of what we've never seen, but yet we're getting a reflection from it 
as we walk into the mirror. And we get ordered up, and then we go out and face our day. But we've never seen our face. Never seen it. James has something to say, say about that. He says in James 1, 22 through 25, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who hears the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. See, the Word of God is an accurate mirror of what God put in us that He wants to see reflected out of us. And it's a prosperous identity. It's a prosperous soul. So, if we look into the right mirror... You know, all of us have, we've been to circuses and carnivals where they have that wacky mirror, right? You got that? You you walk into that mirror and your arms are like a thousand feet long and your head is the size of a peanut and your body looks like Humpty Dumpty. You know, and, and we laugh at that, but the reality is we would never believe that that's us, right? We know that we're being fooled when we go to the carnival and we see that mirror and we step in front of it and we laugh And yet, all too often we get in circumstances of life and we think that that wacky mirror is our identity. Rather than the mirror of the Word of God says about us and who we are. So if you're overwhelmed a lot, wrong mirror. If you're making excuses for what you can do, wrong mirror. If you say your finances will never turn around, wrong mirror. If you're thinking, I can never forgive myself, help me out here. If there's constant feelings of helplessness, if the doctor said, I'm alone and I'm not loved by God. But instead, you say, I feel grateful. Right mirror. I feel hopeful. I feel fruitful. I am faithful. I'm righteous. I am holy. I can accomplish His vision. What mirror are you looking at? James finishes out here and he says this in verse 25. He says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. Who's the perfect law? Jesus. Jesus is the perfect law. He fulfilled the law perfectly. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in whatever they do, living from a prosperous identity. Here's the second aspect, and that is to renew God's original mandate for us. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every living creature that moves along the ground. When did that mandate stop? I don't think it has. It's four things that are listed in there. God says that when we're put on this earth, we're we're called to be fruitful, increase, multiply, and subdue the earth. That's the original mandate. It's still in place. Then in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, Jesus died. He rose from the dead. He's given instructions to the disciples. And and Luke writes there, he said, Jesus began to do and to teach. In other words, he wasn't done on earth. He accomplished his part, and now he says, church, I want you to do your part. He began to do, it says he began, he he shared what he began to do and teach. So there's more to do, and we're continuing in that today. Living out of a prosperous soul, looking into the face of Jesus. 
God wants to equip us to live that way and to think that way. Here's the next thing. And that is the anchored faith that generates a prosperous identity. When you have anchored faith, it generates a prosperous identity. See, the Bible's not a rules, a book of rules to follow. That may be news to some of you. But the Bible's given, or the rules were given, so that we would see that we needed a Savior. That's really why God gave us the rules. Up until the point before the Ten Commandments, that then got folded into 613. It sounds like government, doesn't it? <laughs> God started with 10. It got, it got the legislation passed up to 613. And then when Jesus came, he brought it back to two. Amazing. So the law wasn't written to be a, a rule book follower. The law was written so that we say, I need a Savior. And God says, I was, I was waiting for you to share that. So how should we then look at Jesus coming? We should say that this is what the Father says to us. Come and join my Son who did it perfectly for you and as you. And let me reward you as you do it perfectly too. Or we're like, no, 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 I mess up in myself. No, that's how it works. God is doing it through you. We're, we're walking, we have it, we're walking into the perfection that he has. And the way God sees it, it's already done, it's perfect. We see us walking into it, God already sees it done. That's living with a prosperous identity when we see it his way rather than our way. Hebrews 6, 17 through 20. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his, purchase, of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is for impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. For we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. There you have, summing it up. God says, I want to give you an anchor for your soul, and that is the faith that you believe in me. I said earlier that when we live by faith, that means the external hasn't happened yet. But that shouldn't diminish the fact that the internal within us believes that God will bring it about. That he's promised to bring it about. To get to that place of assurance. That's living from a prosperous soul. Question one, are you currently living from a prosperous soul? Do you have a prosperous identity? What does that mean? It means that you have clearly uh, operate life thinking that you're accepted, love, and, sig and significant regardless regardless of your present circumstances? Question. Our identity always comes from the outside, then it comes in, and then it grows within and comes out and changes the outside. Number two, do you live with ups and downs, seasons in your life, or a steady, constant fruitfulness? What happens... The scripture out of Jeremiah says that when it gets, starts getting dry, the circumstances get difficult. <clears throat> Instead of running from those circumstances, we, we, we drill down further with the roots that God has given us because we know there's fresh water down below. We know that God has a fresh view, a fresh understanding. We know that God has fresh vision. And instead of letting the circumstances cloud and overtake us, we say, no, I'm going to drill deeper because I know there's a spring. I know there's a river. I know there's goodness. I know there's prosperity. I know there's peace. I know there's confidence. I know there's faith. Therefore, I'm going to drill down a little bit deeper and tap in to that which I haven't yet, but I know that's there. That's faith. Living in faith. Number three, what mirror are you looking at? What's coming back? The mirror of the word says, My son, my daughter, whom I love, with you I'm well pleased. 
That's looking at the right mirror. The wacky mirror says you'll never make it. You're, everything's out of place. You're physically stressed. Why not just give up? That's the wacky mirror. But God took Jesus and he <clears throat> whacked him out pretty hard. It says he was treated. The sins that we should have been punished for took upon him. And he straightened that out so that when we look in his face, we see a perfect reflection of who God is for us. Let's not forget who we're looking at because who you look at, you grow in. See, whatever, whatever you pay attention to, you grow in. You take on. You pay attention to the problem, the problem gets bigger. You pay attention to the solution, the solution gets bigger. That's the choice we make. The world says, always look at the problem, look at the problem, look at the problem. Looking at the problem doesn't solve the problem. Looking at the solution solves the problem. And we're all guilty. I'm guilty. See, God is working with me to, yes, identify the problem, but then jump to him for the solution. Just like happened in that conversation between those two people that were headed different directions because of misinformation. They just said, God, speak. And he spoke. And he brought order. It brought healing. Living from a prosperous soul. It's a profound thing to get a hold of. If you're not experiencing a prosperous soul, I want to remind you of several things, several, several uh, aspects of the Word of God, and these are not new, but I want you to, to receive them as if they're fresh today. Not living, I say, I, I, I don't think I'm living from a prosperous soul. I want you to hear these words, and then we're going to pray a prayer as we, as we close out here today, recite together. Here's the first thing. John, 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You and I should live with that every day, no matter the circumstances. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Here's another one. This comes out of Isaiah. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Do you know that the enemy's trying to form weapons against you to prosper against you, which is actually the opposite of what actually happens. He kills you. He destroys you. He robs you. That's his prosperity. But the Word of God says that no weapon formed against you will prosper. We need to carry that with us. That's what a prosperous soul does. Here's another one. You've been seated with Christ in the heavenly places far above all problems. <laughs> See, when problems become evident to us, what happens? It feels like Goliath overtaking us. But this verse says, no, I'm looking down on my problems, not up at them, because I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, operating from a prosperous soul. And here's the one that actually came to me last week during worship and brought it around again. This is really good. No eye has seen. Your eye has not seen yet. Let me continue. Your ear, no ear has heard. Your ear has not heard yet. Your mind has not conceived yet. Sounds like children, doesn't it? Fruitfulness. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has ever conceived Let's finish it out. What God has prepared for those that love Him. Do you love Him? Wow. See, those kind of simple things that we gloss over have such powerful truths in them that if we would live with those inside of us on a daily basis, that things would begin to change around us. And even if they don't, we can still live with a prosperous soul. Jesus did. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Did finish my sentence. All right, let's pray together. Can we do that? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up, and I just want to share this prayer with you, and and let's uh, let's pray it together. And uh, again, I just invite you to like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Well, then just just kind of listen, take it in. But I think you'll be blessed by saying this together as a declaration of faith. Heavenly Father, I believe you sent Jesus to show me how to have a prosperous soul. I desire to be planted in the stream of your word and be fruitful in my soul regardless of my external surroundings. Jesus, you are my example. As you are, so I can. Forgive me for looking in the world's mirror instead of the mirror of Jesus. I have a mandate from heaven to fulfill while I'm here on earth. I invite you, Holy Spirit, to remake what needs to be redeemed in my identity so I can live from living water springing forth within me of the Holy Spirit. May my soul always be anchored in faith, hope, and love from this moment on into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.